Uh, so thanks so much, everybody, for joining here, uh, base to base. I know it's always uh, good for a lecturer to speak face to face rather than online. So it's kind of like gives you more energy. So um, thank you for being here. And we are also recording this for the DTX uh, uh, program, which is supported by Startup Estonia. Uh, and uh, the goal of the whole program is to kind of bring uh, the Estonian healthcare stakeholder community to understand what are the EDXs, why everybody's talking about them around the world, uh, how different countries have regulated them, and um, and how to actually build uh, digital therapeutics applications. And, and most importantly also, what is the definition? So, so this is, uh, many people can understand everything when we talk about digital health. Uh, so, um, would you have a focus and this time the focus uh, of the program is, uh, is uh, digital therapeutics and um, what else uh, so the program will also be last about six months uh, and will um, will include different perspectives from different countries how they have uh, regulated incentivized uh, making of uh, digital health applications which patients can use at home and it it also has a treatment purpose. So, so this is uh, this is I think important in order to increase the level of the, um, of the ecosystem in Estonia uh, and and increase the quality and of course in the end uh, help patients who use them. And uh, German actually I think um, was the one who uh, kind of pushed this thing going. Uh, Germany is a huge healthcare market. And um, and uh, the DIGA uh, is is a word that I think in Estonia also everybody has been using for four years. There's a DIGA model in Germany that there are a number of apps. They are prescribed, and, and then later on there were also some critique coming out of, from there that the, not everything is uh, super rosy, but the, but still uh, it's it's a very beneficial uh, like a model, and everybody can learn from. And now around the world there are different models. So. Uh, and the first presenter of this program, Megan Clojure from the Index Alliance, also talked about uh, the French, the uh, Benelux model, about US a little bit. Uh, so there are many countries who are incentivizing uh, the healthcare ecosystem to build uh, digital therapeutics. So now I can pass the word to Jessica. Thank you for joining. Uh, I know Jessica for a long time now, um, and since. Uh, uh, she helped us out in Germany uh, in 2000 something, uh, 16. 16, yeah. <laughs> so uh, a long time for a startup, but uh, this is uh, kind of also shows that it takes time uh, to build things. So, um, and Jessica has a uh, diverse background in, in healthcare, and she will have a few slides about them, so I won't spoil more. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining, Jessica, and uh, uh, peace. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm actually really thrilled and honored uh, to be, I think, the second speaker on the program, right? Me Megan took off, I think, uh, in the um, beginning of April uh, uh, as a kickoff, and she made like a quick overview about all the countries. And uh, she had one slide uh, for Germany. I have <coughs> 54, um, but <laughs> let's make a deep dive in there. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about digital therapeutics and especially about the DIGAS because there are many pathways about how digital therapeutics can be reimbursed. So they can be reimbursed in Germany by the statutory health insurance system, which has a big, big impact, right? And then, of course, the out of pocket models, which are not working at all in Germany. Why stuff? Because we have, damn, I was not supposed to use that term, but we have a flat rate system, right? So it actually covers almost every care act you, uh, a healthcare provider, can provide. So, um, said that, and then there we have also a pathway for reimbursement for digital therapeutics on a selective contract. So a provider of digital therapeutics, I'm sorry, I'm getting too close. Um, everybody, I, I, stop moving it like, I uh, have a line like... here and I try to hold it <laughs> uh, or the wall. I will try to hold the wall. Um, and of course, 
um, um, a digital therapeutic provider can make a selective contract with each single uh, uh, statutory health insurance in Germany, which we have about 100. Now you can figure when you are a startup, an innovator of a new, how do you say, a software as a drug. Can you imagine how hard that is to go in negotiations with 100 uh, statutory health insurance? And then, of course, we have the private insurance. They actually are, <clears throat> um, I have to say, I have to admit, a little more fast forward. Of course, they are looking into the policies of each um, uh, insured person and they have to adjust it, but they adjust it pretty quick. And they just launched today, so I'm happy to tell you, they have the private health insurance, have a innovation fund, especially concentrated on digital solutions, which includes digital therapeutics. So a couple of years ago, they've put in their 100 billion euro. Million. 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 100 million, okay. which makes a million. I'm sorry, I had to convert. I'm sorry. You were right. 100 billion into that innovation fund to get the, you know, the startup scene and the innovators going. And today they launched the next one and they put in 200 million. So you can see the private insurance uh, uh, or the private uh, insurance taking up a speed on the private level, which is not controversial, but not as quick in the statutory health insurance, even though we are. So that is that. Let me get started. Oh, sorry about it. Oh, here we go. Sorry, it's different. Other way around. Let me show you the agenda. I know it looks a lot, but uh, definitely you get the slides even with my notice uh, in, in the background. Um, so you can read all what I do um, on voice and are not on the slides. You can all read it behind. Um, and what do I want to do? Um, the implementation of apps on prescription provided us many lessons and um, it confirms. Of course, the critical success points to implement this, in which is political leadership, I have to say. The will, definitely. And um, open dialogues with all the stakeholders. Um, stakeholders on the innovation side, but also with the stakeholders on the conservative side, right? As doctors, clinics, and so on. And uh, it also showed us the pitfalls. And through that agenda, I will always show you the criteria of success and the pitfalls we learned. You probably thought, damn, what is she talking here, right? Who is she? Uh, I'm Jessica. I'm a lawyer uh, by profession. I've been working for the German healthcare system over 17 years in different kind of areas. Um, you can see me here, right here. Um, I have been mentoring startups in the digital health field. For example, also Preet, who I met 2016 at Startup Bootcamp. Uh, my company uh, back then, who financed small ambulances, said, damn it, digital therapeutics or digital health, whatever is they're coming up, they will help the doctors I'm financing, right, in outpatient care, they will help them to treat them better and well. Because as a doctor, I'm only on point and not on demand. And I want that that this will happen. So this is how I get uh, back to the startup community in Berlin. Um, um, I've been political leader for the German Medical Association, so I have a deep understanding about how medical doctors or healthcare professionals, I would rather say, 
um, even though the pre um, prescription on app is only allowed for psych uh, psychotherapists and doctors, medical doctors in Germany. Maybe Estonia would do the same approach. Let's put it that way, uh, because I think there could be um, other people of providing or prescribing uh, digital therapeutics. Um, what do I offer? Definitely an honest and objective view and how the development of digital therapeutics went through. Of course, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a healthcare professional. So my focus is on the legal side and about how to build up a network, right? How to build up a, um, um, uh, um, a community to enhance digital therapeutics in your country. Let me see if I get that straight. Or maybe I have to put it that way. I think you said a little uh, Oh, here you go. Yeah. I'm not, I think that's important. You know, who am I not? I'm not a provider of a digger. So I'm not manufacturing it, even though my company tried. So we tried to build up an app in-house, right? Having a little innovation um, department to build that up. It took us two years to learn that as a com company, you're not having 500 people, right? We belong, belong to Bertelsmann. Uh, uh, overall in, in the world, we have over 179,000 employees. It's not working. Innovation can be made in a co-building, right? With uh, companies. And um, of course, there are examples where big companies faced innovation, but actually they're not the first move. So that said, we don't provide any diggers, but we tried. I'm not medtech or digital health industry. So um, I'm in the field of financing ambulances, again, yeah, and dentists and clinics. Um, I'm not an investor, even though the company Bartelsmann I belong to just launched that they're investing in digital health. So if you have any question regarding that, um, I'm happy to tell you about it. They uh, actually put 10 million euro into ADA. I don't know if you know the app ADA. We just financed them like I think four or five weeks ago. Um, and I'm also an advisory at the you know, um, a board member of, at the advisory board of the university clinic in Bonn. So let's go. Perspective, please. It's interactive. I know we have time to get into a chat after all, but if you have a question of understanding or a comment, a quote, feel free. I will tell you if we get into it uh, later on, and then we leave it for the discussions uh, after the session. Thank you. Yeah, you probably think, damn it, um, does she know in what kind of country she is? Yes, she knows. She knows. Just wait for it. <laughs> But I wanted to show you that slide that Germany actually is looking toward the Nordic countries. Because what you did is you built up the key infrastructure before you implemented digital therapeutics, and which we think is a very, very good um, way of doing the approach. And that is actually um, an internet portal from uh, the Gematic which is a, um, a form of, let's say, national agency from the uh, German healthcare minister. Half of it belongs to the German healthcare minister and the other one to the stakeholders, medical doctors and health insurance. And they show us, as a reminder, not daily, but on a daily basis, how far the other countries are. Just to remind us, you're not that far. Look here. Um, I have to write this. They show us digital prescription, electronic health record, and digital identity. This is where we don't have anything. So we started 15 like years ago to try to implement that. Here we go. You probably can see your flag. So of course I know in what kind of country am I in. But digital therapeutics, that has been the 
only point in digitalization we have been oh have been the, the, the role model right the first one who implemented it uh, other than that you guys hit the first place in electronic health record and digital identity and on, uh, online payment and that on the back you can see below there digital therapeutics that's the only task we have fulfilled for satisfaction i would say Where to start with digital therapeutics if you cannot make a definition? You have to know, and I think Preet said that, right? Um, when we talk about digital health, everybody has its own, how do you say, dog in their mind. And this is what I think we did right. We started very, very early to go into the discussion about what is actually digital therapeutics. So investors, and of course, and I think that is very important, and also the startups know, okay, where do we have to try to approach innovation to target digital therapeutics? And I gave you that one because I really like it. It shows that on the cloud, there's digital health overall. And then it's getting towards digital med medicine. And then it's getting towards digital therapeutics. So if you look here, clinical evidence is the key for digital therapeutics. Because if you if you look at digital health, for us in our understanding, you need no requirements of clinical evidence. And also, if you go to digital med uh, medicine we definitely put them more to a medical product than to a digital therapeutic. I have been, I've been trying to put up the slides in a chronicle order. So now we are targeting the digital therapeutic definition and we do it define it by function. And I think that is very important because um, we had that discussion, I don't know if you had it in Estonia, about personalized medicine. I think everybody knew what personalized medicine was, except when they talked to each other, they were kind of like, oh no, that's not personalized medicine. And they ended, yeah, it is, no, it's not, right? So I think to making a progress about what's the function, What's the specification and what are the regulatories to require to define a digital therapeutic is necessary. Because imagine all the innovators, startups, right, who are trying to, you know, come up with solutions, ideas. If they don't know what the area, the scope is of a digital therapeutic, they will put a lot of effort and money into products which will never match the requirements. This is why you need, of course, to put requirements. And then, let me say that, you can overload your framework uh, like we did. <clears throat> um, so it's always a combination about giving a framework where to put up your idea, but also looking it's so quick that development is so quick in software imagine you put a restriction on it and then your product only will last a year let me give you one really really good example data protection germany is we love it we have a slide for that but let's let me just point that out um of course digital therapeutics an app right would love to give an alert to the patient if the patient should do a task or should engage. Since we do not have alert providers in Europe, they all stand at Google and, you know, in the United States, none of or prescriptive digital therapeutics can use an alert to interact with the patient. I'm just saying, right? I, I think it, it makes it um, real 
what what kind of of course you do need a framework but please leave it to the um and not freedom i'm sorry uh, but leave it to the development um of that field right so you have to be open-minded on that too okay so digital therapeutics can be defined as therapeutic interventions through a clinical evalu uh, evaluated patient directed software application intent to improve the process of diagnosing treating managing and or preventing diseases that is the framework we started with but however apps for prevention was not the strategic approved not strategic approved and wanted in germany so whatever targets as a digital therapeutic and that's important in the hand of the patient so this is why all telemedicine solutions not all sometimes bundles yeah within uh, with an application it could be but are not seen as digital therapeutics because they have to be in the hands of the patient and i'm not saying literally so you could use of course a web application or an application right but that is the important goal on it and why are we not targeting the reimbursement of prevention that's history because we never did that. So we're not very wise on that because I think as a statutory health insurance, you should definitely see if approved, yeah, that prevention can have effectiveness on your cost later on. Oh, yes, of course, please. Yeah, about the definition. Uh, does that patient uh, directed me and the patient sign? Uh, does it mean that it doesn't have a, a healthcare provider uh, side at all? Like, can they like see some results or anything? Or it means that it's totally and only for the patient and what the patient then maybe tells the doctor or? Definitely, definitely. So we, we're gonna lay on how do you get to a digital therapeutic um, um, reimbursed by the health insurance. But let me point it out the app itself or the web application of the software who is managing your health for example has to be only in i mean literally be in the hands and in charge from the patient so no one from the outside should interfere with that of so course no, no user interface for the uh, i know what you're talking about yes there can be right so if you want to provide information gathered by the app uh, through the world, real world data in uh, using the app um, while using the app. And you want to, um, for example, um, have a, a, a diary, right? Um, about, I thought, was it here? So I am uh, putting in uh, my diary about what did trigger me and whatnot. And of course, you can transfer that to the doctors. But that is not part of the reimbursement. That's a different, okay. right? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So, of course, and I think that's a very interesting slide. I don't know if you guys are already on that approach. Um, somebody is nodding. Uh, we are defined by regulatory specification. So, DTAs are often classified as uh, software as a medical device, right? And of course, there is M Health. So when you see those two fields, right, software as a medical device and mobile health, in the in the interference and the specification, there is the field of DTX for us in Germany. And which makes it so interesting because you as innovators for digital therapeutics it's first since it's a, it's a software as a medical device you have to target safety and high efficiency while on the other hand there is also an overlap for mobile health you definitely need to target usability yeah and consumer access to it, right? Make sure the appeal to consumer with increasing demands for usability, ease of use, and connectivity. 
So that's a really task here. So um, let me uh, show you now uh, the digital health application in Germany at the current stage. You know, that is not very helpful because um, it's, there is development on the one side, which is helpful. In the other hand, it's um, you don't know how to, what to deal with it. Yeah, what's next on the task for innovators? So in the current set, a low risk certified medical device of risk class 1 or 2A used by a patient alone or together with a physician, which I just told you about sharing the data and maybe getting advices. But we all come to that point, not as far as we wish right now, because the doctors right now don't get rewarded or honored if they interact with the patient who is sharing the data. And that is actually a key point if you want that you need to solve that problem too. We are getting to it and I'll show you uh, in a couple of minutes. Again, not primary uh, prevention, but I told you that already. Um, so let me just, I think uh, we all target, I, I did all target all those information on that slide already by um, telling about um, what the specifications are, regulatory specification, but which is really necessary, you need to know. To become a digital therapeutic, I told you before, that it's important to do the framework or the definition is a positive care effect, which can be provided by clinical uh, trials. And of course, the CE certification, we did that already. And then um, we did what we did. We also set a software, right? Why should the software provide safety? data safety. But of course, when we look into um, the field about what could be done with data, Germany said data protection and data security, and which is not the same, right, needs to be um, target. And this is why we really put a regulatory on it in saying, okay, data protection, data security, consumer protection uh, must be um, uh, fulfilled by the providers or manufacturers of digital therapeutic. And we not, did not only that, but we also put up a regulatory about how to do the pricing. We're gonna come on that later on. Next thing, and I think that's important, it can be described, prescribed, described, I'm sorry, <laughs> prescribed by physicians and uh, by uh, doctors um, and, the statutory health insurance themselves. I don't know if you knew that. I think that is a approach which is not being used as much as we thought it would be, but more and more patients, especially to the uh, statutory health insurance, who are already um, have a good connection to their customers, I would say, right, to their insured people. They are trying to inform about good um, digital therapeutics. And so more and more people are coming instead of going to the doctor, because waiting list, three months. They go to the statutory health insurance and write them, actually. And that, that is the pitfall. You need to have a diagnose about your sickness. So first you need a diagnose, and then you can go and get a prescription by your statutory health insurance. And that's not a pitfall, but I just want you to keep in mind that's a task. Why do I write my statutory health insurance if I'm already at the physician who's diagnosing myself? But and that's a good point. A lot of um, persons in Germany, for example, have diabetes, and they know that for a long time. So that is already in the database of the step story health insurance. And then it makes sense. You can go directly to your insurance and ask for the prescription. Okay, how and what did Germany do to achieve uh, reimbursement of digital therapeutics? Um, oh yeah, let me take you to the winter back of 2019. I have to do like a a fairy tale because it's kind of like a fairy tale nobody thought that would happen in germany um december 29 uh, the german digital healthcare act 
comes into force and aims to improve healthcare provision for patients through digitalization and innovation. You can see that was just the legal framework. That was a political will. Remember when I said what's the success keys to implement digital therapeutics in a reimbursement or in, in your system? It's you need the will and the framework. So the political will to do that. Then we got the draft bill for digital January 2020. Usually we're very, very slow in building up acts, but then we do it just quick. The DGFO established the requirements for reimbursement of digital health applications by health insurance companies. It just passed. I, I tell you now why and how that passed. Because right now, actually, current state, we have a big discussion on the reimbursement matters, right? Because of the high prices. But there, then it just went through. And I think that is very important. We developed a regulatory pathway, how to become a DIGA at all. And we didn't do it by notified bodies all around Europe, which we do not have in, in the amount we probably wish for as um, providers of innovations, right? So we kind of thought, okay, who could do that in our country? And we found the Bay Farm. And let me tell you this, the, it is a success story on the one hand, I'll tell you the pitfalls later on. So, well, yes, of course. How would the somehow substitute you know, that that is? Well, if, for the, uh, not for the MDR, I'm sorry, please um, let's differ between how uh, I get my uh, uh, medical directive, uh, the applications, the certification, I'm sorry, certification, sorry about it, and how do I get reimbursed? So those are two tracks, I would say, two pathways. So the one is about um, data protection and regularity on to how to specific uh, uh, define um, being a digital therapeutic, and the other one is the reimbursement way, and that's the reimbursement way. So please make sure that in Germany we have two tracks, right? How to become a DIGA by function and regulatory, right? And one, how to become reimbursed. Um, nice, huh? The minister, Jens Spahn, said, oh, all my regulatory bodies here who can say this is um, being reimbursed are so slow. Uh, the process in Germany takes up to eight years, right? So if you have a new treatment, for example, in Germany, it takes you up to eight years to get a reimbursed. And he said, no, 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 not with me. I'll do that quicker. I write down in that bill, you have three months time and you decide or not. If you don't decide, if you have no reasons for that, pass. So he put a rush on that. That was really, really uh, extraordinary. And see, December 2019 and August 2020, we started the first year. And then, as you, we all know, COVID came. Um, very important. Um, how did we get there? And I want to share that because I think that was unique. We, no, not we, the Minister of Health looked to the Ministry of Household and uh, um, Economic and said, we need innovations, right? That's your task, not my ministry, yours. We need innovation. Do, do you have money? And the Minister of, um, you know, I'm trying to make speed that up, right? Said, oh, yes, we do. Because, of course, we are there to build economic. We built, uh, we made, uh, we, we are uh, asked for to build innovations. You get the money. And what did he do? He built up a task force called Health Innovation Hub. It was a think tank being filled with people from an industry with backgrounds in the healthcare system. And what they did for a period of like, and that was limited. So the think tank was limited by law, only for the time Jens Spahn was minister. Uh, minister. 
What he did, he gathered the stakeholders around, went into an open dialogue with health insurance, private, public, with doctors, pharmacists, dentists, with pharmaceutical uh, companies, startups. Jens Spahn, the minister himself, invited every week startups from the digital health field and said, let's talk. That kind of made a mindset. I have to admit, I think that was one of the, not the only one, but definitely the one who made, you know, created an environment uh, and the right mindset. So a political strategy well planned and advanced for years. Framework for, for DIGA, and uh, I really want to become now there uh, and, and get to that because um, the framework for DIGA is, of course, the proof of safety. We had that quality and consumer protection, robustness and patient safety, accessibility, support for users and providers, quality of medical content, no advertising. And let me point that out. If you are digital therapeutic, not being reimbursed on a out-of-pocket market, you can do advertisement, of course. So it's a strategic way of looking at it. Do I want that or I don't want that, right? So this is what the minister said, no advertising. You go all the way. Do you talk to the doctors? You do information campaigns, but no advertising. And that is oh, I'm sorry. no, no, okay. Um, and I think that's here. Here you are the leader that you could use right away, because in Germany we say it needs to uh, digital therapeutics. They have to have an interoperability yeah, to other sources. For example, the German health record. Since we don't have one, it is kind of like obvious that it's, nothing is you know, floating in that way, data or in the other way. And which is critical and very, very good because I'll show you on a very nice example how real world data can actually help you in your clinical trials and building up evidence. We did that in Germany, we have that, awesome. So, no, Germany, no. So that's a problem. You do have that. So you do have the infrastructure already. And of course, and I think that's important, if you really want to be successful as a digital therapeutic provider or manufacturer, and you want to scale your solution worldwide, go on a language which everybody else speaks. So we commented on uh, HLL7 and FIRE, you probably know, but you probably guys do that already. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't do that, but, but okay, so. Um, framework for DIGA, I already told you, I think enough about that. Uh, so we have data privacy, which means compliance with data protection laws and regulations, focus on how to collect, process, share, achieve, and there you go, delete the data. Nobody in Germany knew how much and important it is to leave data, delete, right? Uh, because we still have the mindset, the less data, the better. Now we're shifting to the more data, the better, because we have like, you know, a political mind uh, shift. But that was very critical for us. So you have to delete actually everything. So you have to make sure as a digital therapeutic provider, right? how to be sure that you can save the data which is being provided by using your app. Data security measures that an organization is taking in order to prevent any, that's the difference, third party from unauthorized access to your data. Um, processing of data only within the European Union. I told you the nice story about the alerts, so we limited on that. The application and pricing process of a DIA. Let me look at the watch. No, we still are good on time. The application and pricing process of a DIA. I think that is important um, for you to keep in mind how that could actually, as an innovator, drive your business plan to a totally different angle, right? And I'm um, 
and I think it's so important um, also about when you do your regulations that um, there's a reliance for the innovators and the investors and the health insurance about how long can we rely on what we have here, right? Because nothing has been built up yet. And, and if you look at, in, at our um, digital therapeutics providers or manufacturers, the majority are startups. So, um, you know, that the European Health Data Act is coming up. And of course, the German minister said, oh, Jesus, now he's coming from Europe. Uh, let me do my own quick beforehand. So we are waiting on um, an approach on that. And of course, he said, it's called the, I'm sorry, I didn't look that up. How do you say that in, in English? Let me uh, try to uh, translate uh, Health Data Use Act. So he wants that we use now health data. <laughs> and uh, of course, he said, because of that, there's going to be specification and another regulatory for the startups who provide digital therapeutics. So now, you know, as a startup, you just went through the fast track. You're trying to scale your solution and you start all over again, um, trying to do the new, fulfill the new regulatory. So um, let me just refer that. Okay. Uh, from Megan, I heard you guys know the fast track. So I listened uh, to the former speaker, very nice talk, uh, very good pep talk, I have to say. Uh, I was really thrilled by that. So let me just lead you quick through that, just as that we all know uh, the basics. Um, you start here as a health uh, app, and um, then you look if the health app really um, uh, meets the DICA requirements, which is medical device works. We all have that. It's used by patients with or without the healthcare professionals. Oh, no. here I put healthcare professionals and not only doctors. That's good for improvement. Um, and then you need uh, to provide uh, a 178 um, question catalog to our regulatory arm, which is the BFM. The BFM requires exams, the requirements, reading the security, functionality, quality, data protection, data security, and evidence design. Please, you don't need to provide evidence for your uh, digital therapeutic by then, but at least the design studies you should show. And then there's a three months period and that is a little critical because actually the BFAM, the agency, the uh, authority can always ask for another uh, documentation because something is missing. So I have no solution for that. I'm, I'm just saying that the three months period Minister Jens Spahn put in is now extending to almost most of the time a year because then there's always another question and another question and another question. I'm just saying I have no solution for you on that, but just pointing out. And then um, if scientific evidence is still lacking, you are, let, I can say that word, let me just refer to a temporary listing, right? Um, and then you have a 12 month period to gain the evidence, which is good because you already have users or could have users if prescribed by the healthcare professional or allowed by the uh, health insurance. And then if your evidence is proved, you get permanent listed as a DIGA. If you don't prove, approve it, then you're being rejected from the list. So that's just the process in general. Um, I brought you that because if you're thinking about how could um, uh, get along with you on that right, oh, who is the agency, right? Um, so who is the regulatory body? Um, you need to look who actually has the resources. I'm sorry, we said that already, right? Because you need to have people who also have an understanding about digital therapeutics. The B Fund, the agency before was only on medical devices uh, or um, for medical devices and drugs. 
So you need to build up knowledge also on that agency, right? Um, and you can see that's the evaluation process. And you know what they did? And I think that is kind of like, like please discuss about it. They are consultant to you as a digital therapeutics manufacturers. So they get money for that, actually. But they're the also in the same person, I mean, as a body, yeah, the one who is denying or accessing you to the fast track and to the reimbursement um, system. So let's see, do you think it's appropriate to be that and the same person? Just, I don't know, who, who thinks it's appropriate? Any suggestion, thoughts? Sounds a bit like a black box. Yeah. Well, that's right, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, they're doing an incredible job. I'm just saying, right? Because okay, we're discussing about that. And if you are thinking about what would be the best for you, I just wanted to share that, you know, that's the gap we have. Yeah, maybe like it. I mean, in the end, it's it's really hard to codify a super new process in, a, in yes. a, like so so short time. So it makes sense that there's some kind of like a, like a really custom custom process initially, which can be somehow like uh, codified or like made into standard, somewhat the standard later. But it, it's so new, so it makes sense that this this went this way. Definitely, but you know, it's it's kind of like uh, uh, a bit of art, you know. Um, you being a consultant for money, and then uh, on the other hand, you are the authorized body to deny or access um, the product uh, into the market access, right? So, um, yeah. Will they later be assessing also the AI regulation? The same body. It's completely different right now, but it will be also applicable to all the users. So there is also like a regulatory framework yeah. and also like a prior notification in some cases and stuff. So will they be the one how to do that? Yeah. It would be interesting. Yes, because that would be. Different. That would be. Yeah, okay. you, you see, you have to think in advance, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not unusual for the application process to take up to a year. I just wanted to make sure that you can see this. Um, DIGA must prove the positive healthcare effects of the app in order to get enlisted on the permanent track. I'm going to put my focus in the next slides on that too. Uh, oh no, that, that is Germany, uh, I know. Um, the pricing process. Let me just make it quick and simple. If you not listed permanent because you don't have the evidence yet, right? You fulfilled all the data protection, all the regulation. You fulfilled everything, but you didn't have the proof of a positive effect. You can yourself, as a um, provider for digital therapeutics, make up the price. Free. Free. The one thing is, though, and let me just point that out. We had digital therapeutic startups wanted to go abroad like launch their app on, on a self pocket way right to get uh information to security um uh, usability you know how is your product getting into the into the field um and they launched it for example in france or let's say belgium and they put only a price of like one euro fifty to it and then they started to the negotiation with the top association of statutory health insurance and be like, I want 2,000 euro for that. And the statutory top association of statutory health insurance would go and look in the app store and be like, what? And same. How come still the regulatory says you are allowed to do so? I'm just saying that is that was that is really really hard to overcome and it kind of like tidies up the stakeholder um feelings against each other right so there's a really tension what you actually could feel if you and i'm just saying if you listed permanence 
you have to go right away into the negotiation with the statutory health insurance. So that's important to know. So everybody, you know, if you listen about Germany and everybody's like, oh, most of the digital therapeutics just have been released temporary. Of course, if I would be a startup and I have a look at my business case, I would do that too, right? So you always have to look at both sides. You know, why is someone motivated to do so? Oh, here, um, current DGAP market, I just wanted to bring you that because you can see the pricing, the median is 552. Uh, and we're always talking about, oh, I'm sorry, you say quarter, um, three months period. So prescription is always made for a three months of period, period of three months, other way around. And that is the median. And the lowest is 119, a max. But it's, you can see it's a one time license, one time life license is 2100. And um, you can see, and I think you want to build up an ecosystem, right? You want to change and transform your industry into um, targeting digital therapeutics. So you can see that there are top three manufacturers and together they make up 40% of all total deals. I'm just trying to give you an overview you know, about how the balance is. Yeah. Um, here you can see top five deals most prescriptive together they make up over 61% of total redeemed deal codes. I have to go on that point too. What does redeemed deal codes mean? um we have three biggest re received a, pro, uh, a temporary <laughs> authorization in this year and 13 um uh, uh, last year i will show you the overall who are uh, listed and are not later on i want to show you this it's a conversion rate we talk a lot about that because you know when you get described prescribed a drug if I do feel well after the day the doctor described it, I don't go to a pharmacist and uh, um, use the, um, the, the, the drug anymore. It's all everywhere in the world. It's nothing what's new. But of course, digital therapeutics are facing that topic too, especially in the beginning. And this is why I want to show you the conversion rate. Right. So, um, because it's decreasing. Decre it, yes, it, 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 it's been decreasing. No, um, actually, look here. Um, 2021, we only had a conversion rate from 78%. In 2022, we have a conversion rate of 81. So it's going up. Up, decreasing. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was uh, it's getting higher, right? And we started out with a Nobody knows it really exactly because we didn't have too much um, evaluation on it. But there are sayings, I'm just saying, right, that we started with a conversion rate of 60%. So that's actually decreasing. And um, that is also, um, uh, you can see a result on that, um, that actually um, the, the use of Digital therapeutics are tripled, comparing from, uh, from the year we started out in 2020, you remember August, with the first um, digital therapeutic on pre prescription. Um, from all the current manufacturers, there are three which are not located in Germany. That is, I, I had to look it up because I didn't, and we have like currently we have 42 and uh, when, when you we know everybody, right? And then you kind of lose track. So it's from Austria, um, um, a startup, and then one from Romania, Reflex, and from Czech Republic, it's called Vita Diode. So please keep that in mind. What does that mean? You know, language barriers might be a problem. It's just a thesis, right? I don't know. But it seems that um, it is kind of like hard from to as an innovator, right? Develop manufacturer to go to a different country 
even though it's it's actually it should be because it's a digital therapeutic, right? We're not talking about um, care which you do on on yourself, right? You provide uh, by a human being. So it's kind of I'm, I'm just giving you food for thought because uh, I don't understand that, but that's uh, what we can see. Okay. I just want to yes, discuss these prices. Are yes. these like uh, preliminary figures? That yeah, temporary. Those okay. are, I'm sorry, yes, you're right to point that out. That is when you um, are like totally free so on how to, to, yes, exactly. Okay, that's not after negotiations. Yep. And three months. Uh, yes. Uh, three months, and this is monthly price. No, three months, three quarterly. Months, right. okay, quarterly. Say quarterly. Yeah. Quarterly. Yes. Right. Okay. Always a quarterly. Except that one, it's it's a, a, a lifetime uh, prescription. Yeah. yeah. But what are the prices after negotiations? I show you. Oh, okay. Sorry. I show you. I show you. Um, yeah. Now with the prescription model, I know it's a lot, but there are so many tasks to get to the market you have to consider. So it's not only um, about how to become a DIGA and what do I have to fulfill, but also how do I get as a DIGA into the hands of, um, of a person, of a patient. And I tell you what, I told you about the key success, now I tell you about the pitfalls, okay? Told you, Two way, two options of uh, prescribing: the one by a physician, the other one by um, the statutory health insurance. Maybe a pharmacist wouldn't be as stupid, also as the one who prescribes it. I'm just saying. And we have another pitfall. I would say, I would say, because hospitals cannot prescribe it unless they are trying to get the patient out of the hospital so um you know uh, so if the patient is in the hospital right for an acute behavior acute uh, treatment it is not allowed to prescribe but only when they are um, sorry i'm the wall moving it um, um only when they they are being recharged and i don't know in about your country that as a doctor, when I recharge a patient, I sign documents and out there are. Because I think, in Germany at least, the outpatient treatment takes care. So the doctors in the hospitals actually really don't look overlook what should they maybe prescribe to have the, the patient at ease when they are out of the hospital, right? So that's the problem. And here we go. You get it prescribed. What happens then? You send the, because we have no electronic recipe, you send that to the health insurance. By mail. By a book, like paper? Book. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the health insurance systems want an envelope with a stamp on that. There are others, mailing and all this kind of stuff is also, or barcode could also be used. Mainly it's a very analog process. <laughs> and still 80% option. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. It's a cool process. Mm -hmm. yeah. What does it do? So actually, actually, we have been, I've been searching so much for that, yeah, um, to show you in, in a quick way what's the pitfalls. Okay, the health insurance company gets the prescriptions. Then the health insurance company verifies the prescriptions or the patient's request and sends a prescription code to the patients. What did we do? We put another regulatory act between a pre prescription and to receive it. I do understand by drugs, yeah, I have to go to the pharmacy, but it's we talk about software. Why that? And of course, the health insurance companies, we have 100, right? They all have different processes on that. They're trying to, um, how do you say, uh, get similar on it, 
yeah? But of course, each one has a first. So then the patient um, in, uh, because enables, and you know what, that period, that period sometimes takes up to six weeks. What do you do as a patient? You get a prescription. I mean, that's a prescription being reimbursed. And then you get it, oh, I'm sorry. Um, and then you then you get it six weeks after. That's hard. That's a pitfall. I have to admit that's a pitfall because after that, as a patient, you don't care about it anymore. Okay. And then um, there's prescription code enables the patient to download the DIGA from the corresponding platform and activate it without a charge. And then from the DIGA platform, the mentor provides access to his DIGA in an app store or on the homepage as soon as the patient downloads, here you go, and activates the DIGA, the prescription code is transmitted. Carefully listening. I, we had a negotiator, we had talks about that, uh, discussions, I can tell you. Because what do a, a digital therapeutic provider needs to go to push the patient to actually download it then. Because he's out of hand, six months ago, uh, six weeks ago, he got the prescription. How can you interfere and interact with the patient? That is, you, you really need to think about that. That's not good. And then um, based on the redeem prescription code, invoicing the health insurance company can be created as soon as a contract agreed uh, um, um, uh, the money from the health insurance, right? There are health insurance who do have an easier way. I'm just saying that not all of them. And it depends who your patient you were targeting is actually a charity. Well, the prolongation of the prescription is when the three months is over, then it's uh, and the drone automatically, or that is, uh, it starts uh, once again, or because uh, the need is for three months, isn't it? Because the price oh. is for the same one. Um, no, um, the, it's, it, no, it, no, wait. Um, like all prescriptions in Germany, which are being reimbursed, there's a period of time you can, um, how do you say, um, put in the prescription. If you don't put it in, for example, to the pharmacist or to the insurance, um, the prescription loses its validation, I would say, right? So that's normal. Um, and it's a good question. I have to answer you later on. What happens if you as a patient put in the uh, prescription to the health insurance and they don't speed up. I would say it's prescribed. You did everything you could do as a patient and then you still get the DIGA for the next three months. But what does happen uh, to the pricing? I have I have to admit I have no answer on that. Okay, but it's a smart question. Maybe maybe you uh, asked about uh, the re, re uh, prescribing meaning that if six months is over the new, result, one. New, one. Uh, new one. The new one. Renewal, renew like renew renew prescription renewal. Renew uh, so meaning that uh, like they are all three months on the on the system, and then what happens uh, in three months if you need to uh, if you need to continue? Uh, yeah. Then then you have to get back to the um, uh, to the uh, uh, doctor. Yeah, but yes. Again. And starts all over again. Okay. Because oh, basically oh, they were oh, all chronic oh, patients. <laughs> we have talk about that. We do. We have discussions about that. So, um, what could be the more convenient way, right? Uh, and you, you can see. One time license that we are talking about that. That there is also, and it always depends. Actually, I have to admit, it always depends on the digital therapeutic. You could also be a smart, not maybe not smart. I don't know. Um, you could also say. I want to be prescribed for six months instead of three. It just happened, and I don't know the motivation. We can discuss about it. Why the most of the digital therapeutics said, I want a three month period. Maybe to regain the reach or the, the, the charge, um, the payment. 
but maybe because nobody knew how fragmented and complicated the way of getting prescription can be. Because if you look at chronic disease um, people, right, they are often they must go to their um, um, general practitioner, for example, um, to so the general practitioner can have uh, uh, have to, to relook at it, right? So it makes sense, of course, if you're digital therapeutic, yeah, always to renew on the same cycle, the uh, the general practitioner would seek or see the patient to um, uh, make another prescription um, 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 effort, of course. I have a question. Of course. Uh, is there a case on the uh, patient facing, and how does the doctor or the health insurance know if the app is actually used? That's, that's a good point. Um, the, you saw the conversion rates, right? Um, we're going to come to a slide where I show you, um, uh, or have it here in my hands, um, how many, um, right now from the studies, how many stick actually, patients stick to use um, the uh, prescription, uh, the, the digital therapeutic in their hands. Yeah, and that is only that they redeemed the code, so they downloaded the app. They are very, um, I'm, now I'm nudging, right? I'm making a forecast because there are models coming up in Germany who discuss how can I put a digital therapeutic and combine it, for, for example, with a um, pay by performance code. Yeah. Of course. Uh, yes, uh, I brought you. Let me have a look. Oh, yeah, we have to kind of like speed up a bit, but we have discussions uh, afterwards, we right? Have, this room is booked for two two hours. So, okay, okay. Uh, so uh, let me just find out a lot of positive feedback in the beginning. 81% of, uh, of prescribers have already heard about DIGA, but you know, hearing about the DIGA. Prescribing a DIGA is a totally different thing, let me tell you. Uh, and 62% of DIGA users said the DIGA rather helped me, and 86 are likely to use another DIGA in the future. 77% of the people uh, surveyed believe that pairing DIGAs with their treatment was beneficial. However, only around 164,000 DIGAs have been accessed between the launch in September 22 and 2020. Why do I refer that so much? Because um, we have a discussion about who the prices are so high. Do you know how much that makes um, a, a percentage of the uh, expansions we have in Germany? It's 0.014%. So that is actually not much. And what it's really not bothering. I'm maybe I'm too, um, too emotional right now. But what me, really makes me feel um, not, what I'm wondering, let me point it out that way. In most of the times, we have no clue about the quality and efficiency of care which is being delivered right now. Here, we do have a tool where we gradually and in detail can look if it's really enhancing the quality and the treatment of a patient. And it makes only 0.014% of the expendables. It's around, I think, 44 million, no, uh, 54 million euro a year right now in Germany. And we have a 288, and now it's a billion, I swear to God, a billion uh, expandables in Germany for drugs, medical directives, inpatient, outpatient care. So I just want to put that for you in a perspective, right? Um, okay. The current state of DIGAS, I'm sorry, it's Sherry floating, right? Uh, when Preet asked me, it was January, I put that uh, slide already there. I had the one renewed. It's 42 right now. And we have a lot of targeting mental health. Why is that? Of course, 
we have a lack of care in mental health. Waiting lines are six months, so they're targeting that. Five, for mus uh, muscular and uh, skeletal disorders. Uh, metabolic disorders, oncology, tinnitus, nervous system, gynecology, and urinary disorders, and gastrointestinal disease. So permanent uh, approved right now, they're raised uh, already up again. And um, um, we have um, also some who are revoked. It's easy. They don't match the clinical evidence, period, point. You see most of them address psychology issues and work with self-management tools because behavior is the key that you can, you can do the, the, the benefits. Uh, the person's perspective, um, let me go. I think that that is really important. Um, sorry, I marked that. Um, you can see one fifth struggle to adhere to DIGA therapy suggestions. I think it's important to know what the problems of patients are because it's in the patient's hand. It's their tool. Yeah. So that I think was a very uh, nice number. And um, there are demographical characteristics um, for DIGA users. Majority between 30 and 60, women. And actually, academic level and that you probably can forecast is a big discussion in Germany right now because we are now asking if digital therapeutics make a gap between um, the ones who are digital natives and know a lot and have an academic uh, education and the ones who we actually wanted to target with digital therapeutics. So we raised concerns of, I saying, leaving patient groups behind. That is uh, the current uh, situation. And I, th I found that very interesting too, digital aversive persons with worse health conditions use the DIGAS shorter. So again, there is improvement also on the digital therapeutic sites. More than the half of the users found the DIGA has a good, uh, um, um, there are good additions, I told you, right? But um, only 26A is indispensable. Uh, um, take away, I really, we have uh, studies about that. And I, I highlighted my six, and I know we are running out of time, so maybe I just point out five. Take away, empower patients to gain access and to digital therapeutics. I think it's important bundle digital therapeutics with, for ex as an example, uh, teleclinic providers um, or um, traditional medication, the pharmacist, uh, the, the pharma industry. So if you have an app, for example, for um, diabetes, bundle up with um, uh, exactly with uh, the industry. Foster information through intermediates. For example, pharmacists. That seems to be a very good way. Online campaigns and um, foster patient literacy. And I think that is not only the task on the healthcare system, but on the education system, right? And, um, and understanding, um, exactly. And um, foster digital health co uh, competition. We found that um, using um, gamification, with uh, combining with digital therapeutics is also a very good clue and tailor the DTX to the real time patient. I'm gonna just hop on on that um, because um, uh, there are similarities uh, also from the patient perspective to the doctor's perspective. But you can see uh, that is 2020 when we started uh, we had like 1% of doctors prescribing uh, digital therapeutics now we have to 33 uh, percent and um, so there's an improvement also on the doctor's side um, how, how it, uh, do you know how it distributes like is, is there just a few like who have tried once or it, it looks like a very big number actually like 33 percent of all doctors um, in Germany well, we, you know, we have a lot of doctors <laughs> as you got to know the German system very well um, 
actually it's not because it's it's not uh, by prescribing once but even pre prescribing often so if most of the uh, digital therapeutics are described only for three months period you can see where the 33 percent coming up also up from. so they are increasing i'm not saying that it's not good enough right um but uh, it's still um i mean actually almost every doctor has a patient who matches to a uh, digital therapeutics but what do we have a problem usually the uh, the doctor seeks into the doctor information systems we call in germany and they right away get out the right uh, the right drug we don't have that system yet for digital therapeutics so if you're building up a community right and um, you should really if you have uh, some software developer for their uh, doctor information systems or the clinical information we call it kiss gather them around you know make them uh, be a part of your team to target that um look digger obstacles to, for, of usage for physician data privacy it's still the same Right. So um, we think um, still many healthcare professionals are not convinced by clinical benefits of DIGA. They listen to what they hear on the news. And I show you a campaign where the top association of statutory health insurance had a, a campaign against digital therapeutics, a very big one, I have to admit. Um, so that's what they listen to. And you, as a small innovative group, you start out small. We started out small, right? Um, you have to kind of like uh, try to put something against it. Um, then uh, the general practitioner in Germany, um, over like 60% uh, will go into retirement in the year of 20, I think, 30. You can now kind of like relate backwards or count backwards how old are they right now. So they are also not the ones who are ambassadors for digital solutions. My um, takeaway, because that you can see, you know, uh, I give you just my takeaways now um, here by my notes. Advance the DTX knowledge of healthcare professionals. Offer um, accredited trainings. Yeah, that's a key too. And infos and sessions um, to the doctors. Present studies in medical conferences, publish in medical newspapers and magazines. Ensure low effort prescription. That's what I was talking about, uh, about their uh, doctor information system in the praxis. Uh, provide uh, continued support to healthcare professions and ensure onboarding of the practice staff. We found that very, very important. Okay. Lack of incentives to prescribe a digital therapeutic. The doctor right now gets two euro. The doctor find that himself not very convincing, and the problem is that follow up that gives you. A lot more money but most and i think you ask it right how do the uh, digital therapeutic interact with the prescriber we have only like two or three out there right now who um where the, the digital therapeutic is being included into the treatment so that is also a necessary key to target Uh, lack of adequate information. Look here. Um, main source of information for physicians: information material that you send out. It's not. It's not very digital, I have to say, right? Um, and journals, 84%. I think that's very important. And oh, that I, would, I love. It just got out. I think a week ago. Um, we have professional associations, for example, the internists, and they, uh, it's a medical society, and they build it up about competences about the topic, and uh, they have a, have built up a criteria catalog where the uh, medical doctors themselves 
can get into and be like, oh, that was one of my who said it's it's a good catalog or not, or it's a good digger or not a good digger. So that's important too. And uh, that's a new approach right now. Yeah. What about clinical guidelines? How many like, diggers? Um, most, most, most. most. Uh, uh, refer um, to clinical guidelines. So whatever no, they. No, I mean the way like like the treatment guidelines for diabetes. Like, yes. Do those like include already some? Yes. In the, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. That it, I was. Yeah. 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 I, I was a bit too quick. I'm sorry about that. Um, yes. Okay. Most of the digital therapeutics are mirroring the clinical guidelines. Yeah. Most of them, uh, they, they included it because they just made it uh, on the software. So if I look at Mindable, uh, I'm a mentor of Mindable. Um, it's a digger, the 13th digger. They didn't want to be the 13th digger, but you know, you can choose. And uh, they're mirroring the, the guidelines. Yeah, uh, Zonia, uh, actually too. It's, uh, it's uh, a, um, a digital therapeutic for sleepiness and they match the uh, clinical guidelines um, of, uh, Sleeping disorder. I I didn't. I don't know the medical term for that, uh, which is published. Yeah. I would. I can't tell you right now about like how many percent. The majority, if I'm allowed to say that. Yes. I was just thinking about like what do the clinicians trust when they uh, prescribe anything, and when it's an option there inside the pill. The problem is even though. Most of the, the majority of the digital therapeutics match the clinical guidelines. They still don't trust the, the, uh, the saying of the digital therapeutics. You know, they, they trust a different resource. This is what I'm trying to do because, you know, as a the doctor, you will need to dive uh, deep into the um, BFAM um, uh, catalog to look up which requirements and uh, what the digital therapeutic app refer to. They don't have the time and they don't have the trust, but they trust the medical society. That's the difference, even though it's, of course, they can seek out that information. Okay. I <laughs> I stole from Megan. Uh, Megan always put you um, a slide where she said, please, talk when reading. So I did that too on my presentation. So please feel free to, um, it's all in English, um, to look that up if you want to have further information. Uh, the insurance perspective. Um, let me just have a quick look. I think we should come to an end so we have a discussion. But I think that's important uh, for you to see. Look, uh, I'm sorry, I have to, okay. That has been the price. From those are the start. Those are the startups. Those are the digital therapeutics. On the left-hand side, lighter blue, you see the price for the one year where they have been free of choosing the price. I showed you on the pricing model. Then they have to negotiate with the health insurance. That are now the permanent prices. Can you see that from behind? And this is what I was trying to, of course, I do understand. You have to build up a lot of evidence. You have to fulfill a lot of requirements. You have to, um, I mean, pay the clinical trial in that year. And does anybody know how much a clinical trial for the digital therapeutics cost approximately? What would you guess? Numbers. Keep going. 100,000. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You can three fourth times so it's uh, mainly like between lowest 300,000 and a half a million so you know I, I, there is an understanding from my side of that but I'm just saying you can if, if a cemetery health insurance looks on that and you have to, to see and show as a digital therapy as an economy a raising economy you know what are the mechanism behind it Okay, uh, I think it's, it's it's very clear, right? Where the not a problem, but where the task is. Oh yeah, and that's um, I'm swearing out this, and I'm coming to an end now. That's the campaign of the top association uh, of health insurance, and it's not the single it's, it's not the health sector health insurance itself, but it's the top association. They had a campaign. Look, 
and I mean, they have good money on that. Yeah. Uh, there is a panic app, and it says they raised the cost from 428 to 620, and they couldn't show evidence in the first year. Of course, they couldn't show evidence in the first year. It's allowed not to show evidence in the first year. But can you imagine what that makes with the society, with the patients, with the doctors? If you launch, launch, if you advertise this, um, MS, multiple sclerosis, right? App, our record price from 2077. Of course, and it says it's only a trial, right? So there is, a, it's, it's very hard. Um, I'm just trying to put the awareness on that for you, okay? Um, yeah, and you see um, they show, it's, it's a price politic they're uh, trying to build up. Um, look, you can see it says the migraine app, uh, 11,500 prescriptions for 1.7 million euro. And then they're trying to compare it, how much, for example, a physician would get. And that is not adequate because the physician is only functional on the side at the patient. You, as a digital therapeutic, hopefully fingers crossed, right, at 24-7. I mean, not if ne not necessary, but in general. So that is, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that is giving us Germans a headache if you look at the course of pain. Um, yeah, here also for you to follow up market access and value-based pricing, because those are the, I have to kind of like, um, I wanted to jump to a very nice uh, development and then uh, finished. But uh, please, you all get the slides. You can uh, follow up reading. And of course, anybody who wants to contact via Zoom or Teams, feel free to reach out. Uh, yeah, self repeat. I really want to bring you that development because they are thinking about putting a pay for performance on a on their digital therapeutic also maybe for the reimbursement so saying that um if a patient uses less than two models i'm just making it uh, clear right um zero euro will be charged for the three different apps by self of the addressing anxiety and depression so that's another ongoing development and uh, let me show you that that is so awesome we had uh, the Navio, uh, which is an app against uh, adipotitis, right, uh, overweight. And they could show in the clinical trials only evidence for women because we had too much patients in the trials. But what could they do? And I think that is awesome that this happened. And uh, our uh, statutory uh, arm, you know, made a proof about it. They could gain about the real world data they collected over all the months. They could show that the evidence is not only in a clinical trial, but in the real world data, that's the same evidence for men. And now they extended it for also men so that those are the newest um i think uh, developments i really want to share with you and also that um, we made an effort that for example mindable an app against um, anxiety only for adults could prove that the guidelines refer to youth and um and children they don't need to do the whole process on a fast track again they just need to show the evidence for that um, new group. So that's um, very, I think, positive outlooks I wanted to share with you. And uh, I'm sorry that I kind of like one hour and a half. I had one hour and a half. I wish I would be a little shorter, but um, I hope I could give you a good overview about the better development in Germany. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, but um, questions, please. Discussions, because...